Good morning and welcome to our 11th lecture in the current series and our fifth on the 20th century. In this lecture we shall be looking at 2016 Revisited, the referendum in British politics. 2016 of course was the so-called Brexit referendum on whether or not Britain should continue to be a member of the European Union. As we know, that referendum uh, came to the conclusion that the UK would uh, leave the European Union, uh, but its uh, consequences are still being felt today, and it poses the larger question of what precedent is there, or what precedents are there for referendum referenda in uh, UK politics. We shall be exploring this issue through an essential question. So our problematics today is the referenda, the referendum, sorry, in the singular. Is it a panacea or the Pandora's box of the British body politic? And to do that, we shall be examining three themes, three aspects of the question. The first is to look at a brief history of referenda in modern British politics. Secondly, we shall be looking at the referenda on membership of the European communities and the European Union, uh, and that's very much a question of present history. And lastly, we shall be examining the dimension of devolution, that dimension to the question, and how uh, the referendum of 2016 may affect the future of the Union, that is to say, the future of the United Kingdom. As to the dates, which will be uh, relevant to our lecture today, the initial date, of course, is that referendum of 2016 on the membership of the European Union. But uh, there is also the earlier referendum on membership of the EEC, which was held in 1975 and came to an opposite conclusion. There are also a series of secondary dates. We need to be aware that uh, a referenda were organized on devolution in 1979. And then once again in 1997, the second round of referenda in that year led of course to the present devolved settlement in the governance of the United Kingdom. We shall also be looking at the a referendum on Scottish independence in 2014. And the perspectives that will be informing our inquiry are those of political science, of political history, of course, and particularly of present history, since we're looking at uh, contemporary issues in British politics and society, and uh, to some extent, geopolitics. As you see from slide seven, the 1973 referendum on the question of whether Northern Ireland should remain part of the UK or merge with the Irish Republic was the earliest uh, of all. The outcome was that Northern Ireland would remain in the UK. Eight of the 12 referenda we have mentioned so far have been about devolution or related matters like the 2014 Scottish independence referendum. A referendum on the electoral system was held on the 5th of May 2011 and that rejected uh, a proportional representation based model called the alternative vote uh, and maintained the first-past-the-post system. So 
There have been 11 precedents of referenda in British politics, and you can see uh, on slide 8 the table that I've drawn up of the dates and the issues with the movers, the agencies, in other words, that brought those referenda, uh, and the results, the outcomes. One of the outcomes is a cancelled out yes, which has turned into no, and that reflects the referendum a decision on a Scottish Assembly on the 1st of March 1979, which uh, found a, a narrow majority in favour of that Assembly, uh, but without a, a qualifying number or percentage of the electorate having taken part in the referendum. So effectively the outcome was negated. Generally, the referendum has had a positive outcome. Seven of the votes have been yes, and only five of them have been no's, including the 2016 referendum on EU membership. Labour has sponsored a majority of those referenda, seven to the Conservatives' five. The table reveals a pattern whereby referenda have come in waves, four happened in the late 1970s. They were all brought by Labour. Four, again brought by Labour, in the late 1990s. And a further four in the 2010s, brought by the Conservatives. The first and the last in response to splits in the ruling parties. The first to split in the Labour Party, uh, and the last to a split in the Conservative Party. The middle wave was to halt the erosion of New Labour's electoral heartlands under the challenge of the nationalist parties of the so-called Celtic, Celtic periphery. But it was also an attempt to build a broad centre-left consensus, encompassing both the Liberal Democrats and moderate Conservatives. Uh, I note that the first wave coincided with the unravelling of the post-war political consensus with its bipartisanship on constitutional issues. The second and the third waves followed hard on the heels of 18 years of Thatcherism and the death of that consensus. What about the referendum in principle? Well, opposition to the principle of the referendum has centred on the idea that it is alien to the Westminster system of representative democracy and a dangerous excursion into the realms of popular democracy and populist demagoguery. Clement Attlee famously epitomised this position when Churchill proposed holding a national referendum to extend the life of the wartime coalition government a government which had been in power continuously since 1935 until the end of the war. Attlee reminded Churchill that the referendum was the instrument by which Hitler and Mussolini consolidated and extended their power on the road to totalitarian rule. I quote, I could not consent to the introduction into our national life of a device so alien to all our traditions as the referendum which has only too often been the instrument of Nazism and fascism. So Clement Attlee, the then Deputy Prime Minister of the wartime coalition government in conversation with Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister, in May of 1945. There, the, the European precedents that Attlee was alluding to uh, were the spate of referenda held in Italy and Germany in the 1920s and 1930s, during which fascism and Nazism progressively extinguished democracy through the ballot box. And you have the list of those uh, referenda on slide 10, beginning with a referendum in March of 1929, which approved single-party rule in Mussolini's fascist Italy, uh, to the referendum of April of 1938, 
in which uh, German voters approved uh, effectively the monopoly on power of Nazi candidates for the Reichstag and also improved the Anschluss with Austria. What are the arguments in favour of holding referenda in representative democracies like Britain's? Well, uh, on slide 11, I have uh, listed five basic arguments. The first is that people get to take decisions which affect their everyday lives. They get to take those decisions directly. Secondly, the referendum stimulates grassroots involvement in pub public policy making. So it brings uh, people closer to uh, that decision making. Thirdly, um, it makes the legislature, the parliament, uh, put the public interest first rather than the interest of lobbies. Fourthly, uh, it counters special interest groups and those lobbies that I've just mentioned that may influence uh, MPs voting in Parliament. And lastly, it overcomes legislative obstructionism and facilitates reform. However, arguably there are more arguments against the referendum and on slide 12 I have listed seven of those arguments. Firstly, that the questions may be poorly framed and ballots badly drafted. And of course, in the referendum on uh, the European Union, it was argued that the question was, uh, was poorly put, as we shall see. Campaigns are also expensive to finance and vulnerable to capital interests when it comes to a referenda. The, the voter may be ill-informed or misled and loses the expertise of representative democracy uh, on what are often complex and technical issues. So holding a referendum on European membership that resolves the whole question uh, as a yes or a no is arguably a, a simplification um, of the issues. A referendum also calls for a stark choice to be made on single issues and which can undermine political parties and the democratic process. The vote may embody and embolden distrust of representative institutions and on both of these counts we've seen the consequences in the destabilisation of, uh, of British uh, democracy and democratic processes since the Brexit vote. Single issue politics is encouraged by referenda at the expense of reasoned debate and consensus. Um, and so there's a tendency for single issues to resolve around passionate beliefs rather than, uh, rather than arguments. Minorities are subject to the will of the majority through uh, referenda and their rights may be sacrificed as we've seen uh, minorities in, within the United Kingdom like the Scots and the Northern Irish or indeed uh, minorities uh, within the nations of, uh, of the United Kingdom. Uh, so that is to say the uh, university cities for instance which voted largely to remain um, whereas the rural areas voted largely to, to leave, uh, that creates uh, a kind of uh, domination of majority, of the majority over minorities uh, in the internal uh, affairs of the state. This leads me to my second section. Uh, which looks at the issue of whether Britain uh, should be part of Europe or not as a key contemporary uh, question uh, mobilizing much of recent uh, historical 
debate uh, and bringing it to a head as a recurrent trope has been used to describe the Brexit vote, which is that of Alice in Wonderland, uh, Alice in Brexitland, as you can see from the title of this, uh, of this uh, satirical book. It reminds us that uh, David Cameron, like Alice, fell down the rabbit hole of British politics into a dystopian wonderland of Britain's uh, 1979 referendum on EEC membership. Um, which, of course, uh, came to a very different result. If we go back uh, to that particular precedent, the 1975 EEC referendum, we see in slide 14, uh, represented here in a, we see it represented in a cartoon of a split Labour Party, which I shall explain in a moment. That referendum on British membership of the EEC came hard on the heels of the United Kingdom's accession to uh, the communities on the 1st of January 1973 under the premiership of Edward Heath, the, the then Conservative Prime Minister. Edward Heath was a declared Europhile. His successor, Harold Wilson, however, committed early to holding a referendum on membership following his defeat in the 1970 general election. Uh, and he did so to uh, avoid his party splitting over the issue into a Europhile right and a Eurosceptic left. This cartoon by M. Wood alludes to Wilson's populist streak. Wilson, after all, had awarded the MBE to the Beatles. He had uh, celebrated England's World Cup victory in 1966 and uh, Leeds European Cup uh, final uh, in 1975. Uh, in the cartoon, we see the noisy shadow cabinet left-wingers on the right who want out. They are uh, leading members and former ministers of uh, Labour governments, Peter Shaw, Michael Foote, and Tony Benn. And on the left-hand side, the right-wingers who are James Callaghan, uh, future Prime Minister, Dennis Healy, uh, and Roy Jenkins, the future President of the European Commission. The hapless Wilson is seen uh, to the side, offering to play ball with the referendum. Wilson's renegotiation of the terms of British membership um, are, are an interesting precedent for Cameron's referendum uh, because they involved the, the idea of renegotiation of those terms. And in this cartoon, we see President Valéry Giscard d'Estaing of France and Chancellor Helmut Schmidt of Germany looking on skeptically as the British Prime Minister Harold Wilson reenacts a scene from the popular movie The Sound of Music against the backdrop of the Alps. Uh, the hills are alive with the sound of the echoing word referendum. In reality, both the 1975 and 2016 renegotiations were fig leaves meant to paper over the cracks of party divisions. The 1975 referendum on British membership of the EC was held barely two years after it joined. The referendum was effectively asking the British electorate to peer into the future and to weigh up the costs and benefits of a membership that had only just begun since accession started on the 1st of January 1973. The renegotiation was perspective to the extent that the UK had yet to see the economic benefits of membership. For instance, the opening of the Channel Tunnel, which came much later, of course, in 1994. The question, as it was formulated on the 5th of June 1975, was as follows. Do you think that the United Kingdom should stay in the European community, the common market? Yes or no? 67.2% of the electorate voted yes only 32.8% voted no. So uh, a 
roughly uh, two-thirds, one-third majority. Every English and Welsh region voted yes. The only no majorities were in the Shetland Islands and the Western Isles of Scotland. And the turnout was relatively uh, good at 64%. If we fast forward to the 2016 referendum on EU membership, uh, it's uh, set in crisis a rolling political turmoil which threatens almost daily to turn into a full-blown constitutional crisis in the United Kingdom. Before the broken promises of Brexit made the word referendum synonymous with a political car crash, as we see in this Jennings cartoon of 2016, the device was used by both governing parties to diffuse potentially divisive single issues in British politics, as we've seen, EEC membership, devolution, decentralisation, but with limited success. The question, as it was asked on the 23rd of June 2016, was as follows, should the United Kingdom remain a member of the European Union or leave the European Union? The leave vote was nearly 52% and the remain vote was almost 48%. However, there were important uh, discrepancies between the nations, whereas England and Wales voted in their majority to leave, Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to remain. The highest vote for leave was recorded in the east of England, in Lincolnshire, Boston, the town of Boston, at 76%. The highest vote for remain was in Gibraltar, a British overseas territory, at 96%. So why has referendum become a dirty word in UK politics today? First of all, because it's, it, it, it tries to resolve uh, complex political issues in a single yes-no question. It has involved allegations of the faking of facts. It has put passion before reason, hearts over minds. It is seen as an abdication of political leadership and responsibility uh, in favour of uh, short-term uh, quick solutions. The, how the question is framed is problematical in a referendum. The wording on the ballot uh, may open up uh, possibilities, may in fact uh, lead to a bias uh, in the minds of uh, the voter, for instance, should the United Kingdom remain a member of the European or leave the European, uh, seems to present leave as the more dynamic of the two options. Minority rights can be sacrificed, as we've seen. There was always the possibility of a protest vote, and it was argued that after uh, the referendum of 2016, uh, that uh, there were many regrets, so regrets amongst Brexiteers who had voted in favour of leave to protest more broadly government policy, uh, and that uh, it has been described also the referendum as playing two-chamber Russian roulette, that is to say Russian roulette with two bullets in the pistol. Uh, it's too much of a black and white choice. There is the possibility of recoil uh, from uh, the decision and knock-on effects as well. This leads us to our third uh, theme and consideration, which is what is what is the relation between uh, the referenda on uh, Europe and the referenda on devolution. Um, now, the devolution referenda in Scotland and Wales were held on the first of March, nineteen ninety-seven, or at least the second round of uh, referenda were held, and the results uh, were seven, seventy-four percent. 74.3% in favour of uh, devolution in Scotland, 
and a very narrow majority, 50.3% in Wales. The turnouts were much lower than in 1979, just over 60% in Scotland, and barely over 50% in Wales. Did uh, the devolution referenda open the Pandora's box of nationalism in the United Kingdom? The objective sought by the Blair government was to shore up Labour support in its heartlands of Wales and Scotland by making timely concessions to emerging nationalist sentiment. But in the event, the party still needed co to form coalitions to govern in the devolved assemblies. It can be argued that uh, devolution opened a Pandora's box of resurgent nationalism on the Celtic periphery, notably in Scotland, where the Scottish National Party was soon to command a governing majority. Subsequently, on the 18th of September 2014, uh, the SNP was to organise a referendum on Scottish independence with the question, should Scotland be an independent country, which uh, led to a no majority, 55.3%, uh, against that proposition. However, the outcome of this 2014 referendum on Scottish independence was a closer run thing than the final result suggests. The no vote in that referendum failed to close down the debate uh, due to the irresistible rise of Little Englander Euroscepticism in Conservative ranks. The Brexit vote in 2016 went on to reopen the wound or the opportunity, depending on how you look at it. Um, just four of 32 constituencies in Scotland voted yes to independence, but they included uh, one of Scotland's biggest cities, Glasgow, and one of its university cities, Dundee. The turnout was very high, nearly 85%, and both sides agreed that the mobilisation of the electorate had been exemplary and was a sign of the health of Scottish democracy. Slide 23 shows a cartoon that uh, portrays the referendum on Europe of two, uh, coming hard on the heels of the Scottish referendum of 2014 as the nightmare before Christmas. David Cameron had said that the Queen was purring with satisfaction after the no vote in the 2014 Scottish independence referendum. Um, but that success uh, perhaps encouraged Cameron to think that he could win a second referendum on Europe. And it, it raised the spectre of that second referendum splitting the Tory party. Does all this mean that the electoral system in the United Kingdom is under siege? Well, single issue parties have populated the fringes of the UK electoral landscape for some time. But in threatening to split the vote in general elections, they can hold the governing majority hostage the more so when that majority is a narrow one or a marginal one. In the referendum of 5th of May 2011, voters rejected introducing proportional representation in the voting system in general elections in the UK, what was called an alternative vote system. Uh, the cartoon you see on slide 24 uh, uses the trope of madness in British politics and it has its roots in the madcap fringe and splinter group parties that have illuminated that politics since the 1990s at the end of Thatcherism, including one party well known in Britain but very marginal and uh, uh, limited in its impact, the monster raving loony party led uh, once by the ex-pop star Screaming Lord Such, 
but uh, there will be more urbane and disquieting uh, variations. Uh, for instance, the single-issue referendum party, which was bankrolled by the millionaire financier Sir James Goldsmith, and which campaigned from 1994 to 97 for a referendum on EEC membership, uh, threatening to split the Tory vote. The new Labour landslide in the 1997 general election, which swept Tony Blair to power, saw the Conservatives annihilated north of the border and retreating into a little England posture south of that border, while Blair, uh, the Labour Prime Minister, sought to consolidate his third-way centre-left platform by adopting uh, Charter 88's liberal programme for constitutional reform, including devolution. So in slide 24, you have a number of um, uh, marginal fringe parties that have um, influenced the political debate in, uh, on the edges, from the edges uh, in British elections, including the monster raving loony party, the referendum party, the UK Independence Party, the European Research Group, which is not actually a party, but it is a, uh, a movement within the Conservative Party, and uh, the Brexit Party, which is another single issue party. The referendum exposes party divisions. We see that in the 2016 Brexit referendum, um, which has exposed divisions within all of the leading UK political parties. Nigel Farage's Brexit party emerged from the embers of the short-lived referendum party and as an offshoot of UKIP in January of 2019 to campaign for a hard or no-deal Brexit. Uh, while the Conservatives split and swung to the right, so um, a small group of MPs split for the Conservative uh, whip to form a, a party called Change UK, and they swung, uh, and the rest of the Conservatives swung harder to the right in favour of a hard Brexit, under pressure from the Brexit party, Jeremy Corbyn's Labour, in the meantime, sat on the fence, unable to commit either way for fear of losing their leave-voting electorate. We see that the referendum has also uh, been a catalyst for political crisis in the nations of the periphery. This has led to a rise in support for the nationalist parties, the Scottish National Party, Plaid Cymru, the Welsh National Party, and Sinn Féin, who steer an unequivocal Remain-oriented social democratic course. Uh, it helped Northern Ireland form a power-sharing executive in January 2020 after a three-year hiatus. Europe and devolution were more than ever linked in the general election on 12th of December 2019, which Boris Johnson's Conservatives won with a resounding 80-seat majority by promising to get Brexit done, but at the same time to level up the deprived north of Britain, which was formerly a Labour voting region, a red wall, with a more prosperous Tory-leaning south. The United Kingdom will finally leave the European Union at the end of the transition period on the, 20th, on the 31st of December 2020, and this will, this will place the UK at a crossroads between Brexit and devolution. In slide 27, we see a cartoon of the Queen and her faithful Corgi standing with their backs to us at a crossroads in the heart of the constitutional maze of the United Kingdom. They're facing a stark choice between out or in. The cartoon alludes to the refrain of a traditional Scottish folk song of the 19th century, Loch Lomond, which evokes the double jeopardy on the road to Brexit. Oh, you'll take the high road and I'll take the low road, and I'll be in Scotland afore ye, but me and my true love will never meet again on the bonny, bonny banks of Loch Lomond. By taking the low road to leaving Europe, by a hard Brexit on the 31st of December 2020, 
the UK may well lose Scotland and possibly Northern Ireland in the process. Does this mean that we are heading towards a second Scottish referendum and the breakup of Britain? The prospect of a second and successful independence referendum in Scotland in the wake of a no deal or hard Brexit has become more likely following the SNP's success at the 2019 general election where it won uh, more than 8%, an increase of more than 8% in the, in the vote. Uh, it added 13 seats to its representation in Parliament and became the UK's third political party. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, Nicola Sturgeon has argued that the SNP now has a popular mandate to call a fresh independence referendum on a pro-EU platform. Nor can we exclude that the Remain majority in Northern Ireland will force a border poll in favour of reunification. That would be another referendum. The breakup of Britain, long predicted by political scientists like the Scottish, the Scot Tem Nairn, could conceivably begin with the secession of Scotland and the reunification of the two islands in the foreseeable future. By way of conclusion, we can begin by saying the referendum was traditionally imposed on principle as an instrument of policy consultation in British politics by uh, Clement Attlee in 1945. The belated adoption of the referendum in the mid to late 1970s accompanied the breakdown and death of the post-war political consensus. The device has been used by both governing parties as much as to keep the peace and as a panacea for party divisions as to address key issues of national interest. According to Dr. Philip Rycroft, the former head of the Department for Exiting the EU, the referendum is a blunt instrument for resolving existential political issues. When improperly framed, the referendum puts popular democracy on a collision course with representative democracy in the British system, whereby popular sovereignty challenges the sovereignty of Parliament. Leavers appeal to the will of the people, which, according to them, trumps Parliament and is frozen in time. It cannot be reversed. Whereas Remainers claim that the referendum is consultative only and MPs have the last word on policy because Parliament is sovereign in the Westminster system. There is a risk of the referendum on EU membership and to some extent on rolling devolution, that is to say, uh, a devolution that is continually refined, becoming the groundhog day of British post-war politics, whereby the next ballot becomes a referendum on the referendum in a recurring nightmare, never put to bed. <laughs>